Hello and welcome to Plants to Plants Hemp Processing Seminars, Episode 7 by Sci-Fi Systems. Sci-Fi Systems brings industrial extraction and processing technology into the future, and Plants to Plants brings top-tier experts to the table to inform viewers about what it takes to go from concept to completion on a hemp processing plant. Next week on the Season 1 finale, we will be talking to renowned cannabis lawyer Rod Kite, and I want to remind everyone that past episodes are available to watch now on YouTube or on our website. Today's episode is First Hand Lessons from the Field with Stephen Fuhr. On episode seven, we are joined by Stephen Fuhr, a close ally who has extensive hands-on experience getting a facility running from the ground up. Topics covered in this session are the current state of hemp processing businesses, CGMP and why it's so critical to our industry moving forward, increasing efficiency through different solvents and inline filtering, and uh, many other topics. Extra time today will be allotted so that attendees can ask any questions you have about starting, scaling, or any of the topics covered. Um, anything that's topical uh, to the industry is fair game. Um, and this session is for those teams that are hard at work creating and growing the next wave of processing capacity uh, across the world. Our guest is Stephen Fuhr of Paradigm Hemp Processing. Stephen spent the last decade growing med medicinal cannabis, processing a range of extracts and infusing edibles. In 2013, he founded Toucan Farms, which is a tier two cannabis production process processing facility in Washington. He designed, built, and managed one of the most highly regarded state-of-the-art grow and processing facilities in Washington. In 2018, sold Toucan and committed to processing hemp in Oregon, utilizing his diverse experience in extraction and infusing food products. Since then, he has served as CEO of two hemp processing startups, including Paradigm Hemp Processing, and as an advisor to Sci-Fi Systems on new extraction technology for hemp. Prior to that, Stephen spent 12 years in the educational sector and has a degree in business marketing. Once again, I wanna uh, invite everyone to ask questions today, and I'm going to bring up our presenters and pass things off to Emmett McGregor, our CEO and host, and uh, to Stephen. Thank you guys very much. All right, thank you, Edwin, for the introduction and welcome, Steve, uh, to Plants to Plants. Really glad to have you here. Um, it's been, you know, a, a long time working together and uh, and trying to move towards the next stages of what the business might look like. And I know you've done a lot of very in-depth analysis of the market, so I'm really excited to, uh, you know, unveil some of these findings from the field. Um, you know, let's start. Uh, last week, we, we did uh, have a conversation with Ian Laird of Hemp Benchmarks, who gave us a little bit of a view into what the market looks like. Um, you know, but what, that's data. You know, what does it actually look like in the field? What are you seeing um, in demand, supply? Uh, I know your perspective is going to be mainly from Oregon, but uh, you might have some national insights as well. What can you tell us? Well, you know, as you know, Emmett, uh, I've had a wide range of experiences, both from growing and processing to brokering and, and actually did working on designing machines. And the last year has been quite a roller coaster ride for all of us. It's funny when you mentioned hemp benchmarks in two ways. One is when I saw Ian's uh, webinar last week, I've made it required watching for all my staff. I think there's data in that statistics that he's gone over, not only in terms of where this industry's been, but where it's going. And, and, and that data will help us make plans for the future so that we can all be profitable. But the second thing that strikes me about hemp benchmarks is uh, years ago when they, their sister company, Cannabis Benchmarks started their program, I was one of their original contributors. And so when they started up hemp benchmarks, they gave me a call and I've been one of their contributors since. And it was last April, I, I remember the call, I was talking to Bruce Kennedy, who's their staff writer, and he's, he called me, calls me once a month and he says, Steve, what's happening in the marketplace? And when I started to tell him what I saw was happening, he said, Steve, you sound a little frantic. And I said, you know, Bruce, what I'm watching is the entire hemp market melt down in front of and I'm sure I don't need to be, uh, you know, saying this point because everyone knows this, that, you know, prices, and I'm looking at some of Ian's statistics right now, CBD biomass has gone down 85% in price. This time last year, we were getting $4 a potency point. Now it's, you know, 40 cents, even as low as 20 cents. There are some farmers that are literally giving their hemp away. They just want to make room for a new crop. Uh, CBD flour, and relatively stable and right now it's pretty hot uh, but the market for crude oil has crashed 
Uh, Ian's numbers, uh, 93% price drop in the last year. It's extreme. I can get kilos of, of uh, crude right now for under $200. And of course, the core of the market has been isolate. Uh, many of the uh, companies who are infusing products preferred prefer to use isolate because it was zero T. And uh, prices a year ago were 6000 and trending towards 7000 for small volume buys. Now I can pick up kilos for under $600. So, you know, the, the, the market's clearly taken a lot of hits. Supply and demand has something to do with that. But there's been some other factors uh, beyond supply and demand. And I think the biggest elephant in the room that most people know about is once the USDA legalized him, almost in the same breath, the FDA backed up and said, we're going to relegate it to a Schedule 5 drug. Now, clearly, they're looking at options right now to be able to give it what's called generally recognized as safe or brass status. And I think that that is the linchpin that's going to make this industry take off. The other issue, which clearly we all are pretty aware of, is the effect of COVID-19 and this whole pandemic on the industry. It's shut down transportation. It's made work issues difficult. Uh, and, and it's also affected consumers' buying habits. So you put those three together and you really have a perfect storm for what I think we could call the low in the marketplace. Today. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and that's an important thing to realize is that um, based on trajectories of other uh, commodities that we've seen uh, come onto uh, new markets, in this case, it's all private market, have no part public market yet. Um, a low point is almost an, an inevitability, right? It's, uh, it's almost right. a truism that you got to go, down to a certain point before you're going to come back up. So the question is really, uh, you know, where do we turn around and who are going to be the winners uh, when this market does turn around and price comes uh, out from being essentially liquidation pricing that we're seeing right, right. now um, in markets where uh, supply is outstripping demand. Uh, but, you know, what is it that's going to make a new producer or a producer that has the uh, endurance and uh, the capital to be able to muscle through um, this time of lows to, to get to, you know, the promise of continued growth. And, um, you know, and that is, it was worth saying is that, you know, nobody is projecting that the hemp market is actually going to uh, shrink uh, from no. a consumer point of view. Uh, the hemp market's not going to shrink from a consumer point of view over the next five years. It may contract and expand and contract and expand again. Uh, as we see, you know, uh, corrections in the market. But how do you take advantage of what is still a rapidly growing market, but that's seeing this, uh, this bump uh, in the road? Well, that's a good question. And, and just to reiterate, this is just the beginning of a very new industry. And uh, Jay Noller of the Oregon Industrial Hemp Extension at OSU has a great statistic that I really like. He said in 1936, prior to the enactment of the Marijuana Tax Act, which was you know, not the Controlled Substances Act in the 70s, but the beginning of the end for cannabis and hemp, there were over 20,000 uses for hemp. And none of them, in fact, in 1936, no one even knew what CBD was. And the funny thing is now, the only thing that people seem to look at is CBD, and no one can seem to remember the other 20,000 possible uses. And so the quick answer to your question is, and we'll get into this more later, we need to look at some of those other 20,000 uses. But when we talk about CBD, I think the key is two things. One is, is for processors to understand that this product of CBD and hemp is being commoditized. We'll talk a little bit about what that means in a minute. If it's going to be commoditized or has been commoditized, there'll be two omnipotent factors. One is scalability. The amount of size and your throughput capacity will affect your profitability. And the second is efficiencies in the systems that you're using. And so there's also a third factor that I'd like to shift into before I get into efficiencies. Everyone that's in the CBD industry has a dream or an acceptance that the FDA will eventually come forward and give us the ability to put CBD in food and pet products. One of the topics that's been talked about 
is that it's very possible they will not allow CBD isolate. They will relegate that to the medical and nutraceutical field. But we will be able to use broad and THC, uh, you know, full spectrum distillate and broad spectrum distillate in these products. And the core point I want to make here is that whether it goes in a food product or a pet product, the FDA requires GMP certification of both the facility and the processes they're using. And GMP, of course, stands for good manufacturing processes. This is a requirement that all manufacturers are going to have to meet in the hemp industry within the next 12 to 24 months. And right now, and I've toured quite a few facilities, well over a couple hundred, and less than one out of a hundred that I've seen have this certification. The other importance with GMP, beyond being a benchmark of cleanliness, traceability, and production standards, is that it's often a requirement for exporting. And even though the United States market right now has been, let's call it shaky in the CBD marketplace for, for post-consumer products, Europe, uh, many parts of Asia and the Canadian markets are, have a great demand, but they all are demanding THC-free products. Right, and not just THC-free products, but uh, GMP uh, standards that match their specific market. So, you know, US CGMP may not be enough if you're trying to go to Europe. You have to meet the EU uh, CGMP standards. So, um, Correct, that's a good point. Yeah, it, it, it was advised uh, by the, the, the folks that I've worked with that to get the EU GMP certification is really the platinum standard that will let your product be shipped anywhere in the world. Right, and we, we have seen some, uh, you know, some big players, some of the public companies uh, trying to export CBD and, and medical cannabis products for that matter um, into South American uh, countries, into Europe, into other markets. Uh, right. And generally, it seems that uh, they are adopting the EU uh, GMP process, uh, GMP certification as the minimum standard to export to areas outside of the EU. So as you said, the platinum right. standard, if you want to be an international player, uh, stepping up to that next bar. And that means in the United States, you still have to get normal FDA CGMP certification. And then you also have to get European uh, right. GMP certification. So something to, to take, keep in mind in it. And one thing that I've heard from the CGMP folks that we've worked with is, you know, CGMP, it's 20% facilities and equipment and 80% documentation and procedures. Right. So it, it's really about workforce training and documenting your SOPs and, and having things like long-term batch records so that if you have to do a recall on product for whatever reason, you can do that quickly and efficiently. That is the core of GMP, yeah. And, you know, as this industry matures, a lot of people are worried that the, the big guys are going to take over. They're going to gobble, gobble up all the small guys. I feel much like the, the liquor industry, much like the cannabis industry. I think that the hemp and CBD industry uh, certainly will have its share of large players taking over the high volume. But there is room for the smaller cottage. Uh, and I won't use the word cottage. Uh, what's a better term I could use? Um, maybe craft yeah craft a uh, craft group where you know it, maybe someone gets an organic certification which is much easier to say than it is to do uh, or some other type of craft product that isn't so mainstream and I think there's room in the future for people like that as well and yeah, yeah and that's something we've talked about quite a bit is that that you know in that craft niche it's it's sort of um, in the beer and the liquor industry for example the the craft beers are produced in small batches and then shipped to the retail outlets or to right. the consumers, depending on, uh, on the circumstance. Um, in this industry, we're manufacturing primarily ingredients, uh, but perhaps there are some companies that have been quite successful in weathering uh, this, uh, the turbulence of the past year that have been vertically integrated. So that's one strategy to look at. But on the other hand, is there opportunity for craft ingredients um, maybe hops could, uh, could give us an example of, a, of an industry where that is the case, as well as some of the, uh, the herbal um, ingredients out there uh, where single source organic uh, and, uh, you know, intentionally cultivated or regeneratively cultivated crops with a traceability all the way 
uh, through, like uh, fair trade would be another right. example of certification that does this. Um, we haven't really seen those types of certifications and value added ingredients really pushed on the market yet, but it seems, doesn't it seem inevitable that we should see some of that? Absolutely. I think what you're going to start to see are more cooperative models starting to form, which like happens in coffee and other uh, consumer commodities like that. And the other thing also that uh, Ian Laird brought up from Hemp Benchmarks is this industry is moving towards being commoditized in a very formal sense. And in fact, uh, 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 I was one of the folks that Hemp Benchmarks tapped to talk to some of the commodities exchange folks in Chicago. Uh, about a month ago, and they were very interested in both knowing about the industry and one of the key metrics that they wanted to know was what standardization is going on? And the answer is none. But one of the things that's going to have to happen in this industry is much like you have grade A beef and grade B and grade C that goes in bad food, you're going to have to have different grades of hemp, different grades of extract. They're going to have to be clearly delineated, and, and those delineations are going to go into their direct prices. But the advantage of that commodity exchange is, you know, and I hope everybody today that's listening to this goes back to your last session last week and, and listens to that hemp benchmark session, which is really valuable. We're talking about once this product gets commoditized, farmers and processors being paid a percentage of the sales price up front, is that correct? I understand that correctly. Yep. So uh, as we talked about last week, it's you know the 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 futures market actually means you get a portion of the payment um, ahead of even harvest, right? So you essentially get a a partial payment up front. In some circumstances, there's different models for different markets, so we'll have to wait and see what this one looks like. But one option is. Essentially, there's a partial down payment made in order to secure a future price to purchase the commodity at time of harvest. Uh, and then that means not only you get paid up front, but you also know what you're going to get paid uh, at right. harvest. So for the cultivator, huge. And then uh, for the processor, similarly, you can uh, buy off the commodity market at today's price. Um, and know uh, what the volume of availability is. Because right now, that's a big problem that, you know, getting access to consistent lots of consistently uh, quality, uh, consistent potency, consistent moisture content, you know, the yeah. list goes on and on, biomass, to be able to then sell large lots of product at the same quality standard out to consumers month on month, year on year. Um, there's opportunity there for take off the commodity market as well, where Processors might get an upfront payment that allows them to go out to market and buy biomass as an ingredient. Uh, so futures right. go both on the ag side and on the processing side, potentially. We'll have to see how the, that market develops. But. I think the most amazing thing to the thought of that commoditization of hemp is the stability. And that's a word that's just been completely absent in this entire industry is, I mean, could you imagine as a grower or processor, if you're listening to this now, what it would be like to not have the product that you're selling lose 30% of its value every month, month after month. It's been, the last year has been crazy. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you know, you mentioned earlier uh, that efficiencies are going to be important, the importance of scale. We talked a little bit about craft, which is sort of going in the other direction of, of quality management. Uh, but, but when you go to these large commodity scales, um, you know, what do you think is the, the edge, how do, you, how do you get an edge in the market uh, when you're competing against giants or essentially other giants if you scale your business up to, to large Right. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong on these statistics, but a little over half of all processors process about 500 pounds a day or less. Does that sound about right? Uh, that sounds right, and I can double check your data here, okay. but uh, go ahead. And so hold that number in your mind, 500 pounds a day. We'll call that average rate. On the other side of the scale, without naming any names, there are East Coast manufacturers that have taken over hexane plants that have the capacity to do 800,000 pounds a day. So there's the scalability scale. 500 is the average right now, and the top of the market has the capacity for 800,000. 
So for the folks that I'm working with and the machine that we're looking to build right now, I have a perception that if you're doing any less than 500 pounds an hour or a run, a 90 minute run, you will not be able to compete in the next 24 months, even if you're in a cottage or craft brew scenario. And so one of the, 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 the minimum benchmarks I encourage people towards that. And you know, when you look at how to get to that point in a machine that's that big, one of the things you really need to consider is automation. Now, I've got a lot of pet peeves in this industry. Uh, people talking about strain names is one of them. People talking about yields is another one. But my other, yield, uh, my, my other pet peeve is when people say this system is fully automated. Because what they usually have is a CPU, a computer processing unit, that's got various sensors in the system and they're measuring temperatures and pressures and flow rates. But the bottom line is if you have to take the hemp and stuff it into a sock, and then stuff that hemp sock into an extractor vessel. And then when you're done with that run, you got to take that wet sock out, take it out, squeeze it out. Then you're going to take your crude, bring it over to the barrel, to a winterization chamber. And then you're going to take that over and bring it over to a distillation system. What part of that sounds automated? And so to me, a truly automated system is going to be able to load the machine and unload the machine with biomass mechanically. It's going to link the post-processing downstream segments so that in a very real sense, you can have a hopper that's feeding your extractor and at the end is coming out essentially a finished product or finished ingredient. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Emmett, Sci-Fi has been working on that quite a bit as well, haven't you? We have, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it, we've been working on improving these processes across the board. Uh, end-to-end -end integration through, um, you know, at least through end of distillation from extraction that we viewed that as being just the sort of minimum viable standard uh, from a safety perspective. You want to, you know, not be handling anything that has flammable gases in it. And uh, from a uh, GMP and quality assurance standpoint, you want to have as little human contact with the oil as possible. So uh, interconnecting piping between say solvent recovery to storage, storage to distillation, um, just makes a lot of sense. Of course, some facilities are, are not planned in such a way as that is uh, easy to do. Uh, so right. we do work, of course, flexibly with client requirements. But if we have our recommendation, um, you know, we say everybody should plan their facility to essentially be zero touch uh, from point of biomass till end of distillation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit more difficult given the, the uh, batch nature of the crystallization systems out there um, to integrate that directly in a way that doesn't require a relatively large volume uh, storage of distillation, uh, but it's completely viable to do that. Even if you need to split out batches in uh, you know, small storage containers where you're using valves to select which uh, batch container you're going out to and then stage that into crystallization, it's right. viable to do that. It just takes the uh, the planning uh, focus and willingness to, you know, spend some money on pumps, piping, mm -hmm. and uh, and the appropriate uh, tankage to do that. But 100% right. recommended. I mean, from CGMP standpoint, you know, it really gives you a big advantage. And from a labor standpoint, it can also uh, minimize your your total labor. Right. Well, as you and I both know, uh, we both dealt with people who are trying to get the, the, the smallest operation off on the skin of their teeth and it never works. And, and where this industry is gravitating towards is looking at it as a normal manufacturer would. What does this piece of equipment cost? What's the ROI? What's the time frame for that ROI? And when you look at automation, you, know, you could easily with a small scale system, double your cost. Or if you had a $500,000 extractor, you might spend a half a million on automating that. But if you have a larger system, maybe a, you know, a machine that's doing two or 3,000 pounds a turn, would you think that the scale of automating that would be less expensive? So the, on, the, on the control side, um, you know, the, the pricing is really sort of uh, based on per, uh, per points of data feed in and per points of control. So if the, you're scaling up your base system, you have the same number of pumps, you have essentially the same sensor setup, well, your cost for, for, um, you know, for the controls and uh, instrumentation is going to be pretty much the same across the board. Right. 
Uh, now, when you go to uh, conveyor uh, systems and you go to you know, uh, pumps for transfer pumps, that type of thing, obviously you, you do have some price increase as you go up in scale, but, uh, but you have economies of scale. You know, your, your cost per unit capacity um, on across the board is uh, going to be lower the larger scale you go. Now, one thing to emphasize here is you do want to be appropriate scale to your goals, right? So this is why pharmaceutical industry, for example, typically doesn't have giant scale processes like chemical industry does. Uh, if you require very small batching and you need to have very tight batch controls, it is possible to do that with very large continuous type systems, but it's easier to do it with smaller process lines. And in that case, automation actually probably becomes even more important because you're gonna have multiple process lines of the same type to reach the capacity uh, that you're going towards. So again, you can really reduce the amount of labor if each one of those lines is, is automated. And when we say automated, we mean that the process is controlling itself based on the sensor data, not right. that there's sensor data being read out on a PLC right. and somebody is then twisting knobs and pushing buttons. Now it takes fine SOP development, uh, which means that you may want to do piloting, true piloting of your system before right. you go and buy a 100,000 pound an hour system, of course. Um, okay. But that's where we're getting to. We're getting to a market where these early experiences in the field uh, can be treated as pilot programs. And we're hoping that people learn a lot from those you know, 50 pound an hour, 100 pound an hour, even 500 pound an hour type systems and are able to take those lessons and work with us to scale up their dream facility to, to where they're right. gonna sit for the long term. Like I said, five year ROI, maybe maybe even 10 year ROI. That's, that's the way that a lot of these uh, larger chemical industries work. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're able to take market share at that large scale and have a stable, consistent base of demand, well, you know, that's, uh, that's how you build a legacy company. Yep. Yeah, you know, what you just described, I've, I've, I've coined a term, a term, once you trademark it, I call it real automation. And I guess the final point I would make to automation is it's not an all or nothing thing. You can automate segments of your process one at a time as it's affordable. Would you agree? That's true. I mean, if you're going to do automation down the line, it's best to plan from day one that you're going to do that. Do you have to go fully automated when you build the plant? Uh, no, you can implement control systems progressively over time, as long as the hardware that you bring in that you're operating manually uh, can be retrofit. So you want to plan right. it to be retrofitted from day one, uh, rather than trying to go back and, and change something and weld on something that's already had flammables in it or needs to be cleaned, or, um, right. or you're just going to have to pull it out entirely to replace it with a system that has the appropriate uh, instrumentation ports and so on. Well, as you know, this new system that we're working on has some of those components to it. And I, I think to me, it's in the extraction phase that you have to pay careful attention to making sure the equipment can accept automation, whereas linking some of your downstream systems are a little bit easier uh, after the fact. At least that's my perception. Extraction is, is a difficult one because of the, the solids handling component. Hemp, hemp yeah. is a, it's a, atypical solid, the sticky flake uh, product where the sticky component is the valuable component. It's, uh, right. it's pretty unique. One, one thing they learned in the cannabis business and certainly in the hemp business is that, you know, I, I remember when they were trying to automate things like packaging of flour, everything in our business is different. It sticks to things like most products don't stick to things. The fibers wind around things like other products don't. And so it seems like everything we do needs to be custom designed. Which I guess brings us to the whole subject of solvents, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. That's uh, and I agree with you. The solids handling. I think the mill, the mill manufacturers, the conveyor manufacturers of the world have certainly learned a lot. Uh, and those right. who purchased equipment from them, just stock equipment from you know whatever tobacco handling or um, or you know food handling. Well, you can learn some lessons there about uh, why you know hemp is is handled differently. Uh, but we've gotten that expertise now. We're in building partnerships with uh, companies that have done this now for you know a couple of years and really know the ins and outs. Um, Solvent-wise, you know, why don't we just start with what does the market look like? Who's using what solvents um, and you know and how much? Do you have 
any insight? We looked at it a little bit with uh, the benchmark. Right. Well, as you know, I mean, I've, I've been involved in hydrocarbons, ethanol, uh, experimental water-based systems, CO2. I've, I've really seen a lot of different things. Uh, and, and, you know, the word why is really critical. Why do certain industries do certain things? And I'll ask you whys before I get into to our piece. Why is it that the majority of extraction in the cannabis industry is done with hydrocarbon? And I'll put that question out to you. And why do you think more people use hydrocarbon in cannabis extraction? Well, uh, in markets where it's allowable regulatorily, it's, uh, it's a more straightforward process to get the quality product that the consumer demands. So, you know, you get a relatively high quality product with minimal uh, post-processing um, right. or at least with a system that can easily be adapted to post-processing. And there's some good efficiencies behind it. Yep, yep. And so why did everybody run to ethanol? And there's two basic reasons for that in the hemp industry. One was is the hemp industry was getting going. Uh, the National Fire Protection Code really hadn't clearly defined what an extraction lab should or shouldn't look like. That's changed. There's now an FP code for that. People perceived ethanol as being a safer solvent. Uh, some people perceived it as cheaper or easier to get a facility started. And maybe in some cases that was true early on. The other reason is people perceived it as being more cost effective than using a hydrocarbon extraction because the equipment was cheaper. But here we are, you know, roughly two years into the hemp industry and we've come to some epiphanies. And the first is that ethanol is much more expensive to use than people ever thought. There's a couple reasons for that. One is you, know, you have your, your traditional pure ethanol, which of course comes with a high priced federal tax. And then you have the denatured ethanol that most people use, they have a little heptane to it and, and that avoids the federal tax. But the problem with ethanol, as good of a solvent as it is, is that you can generally only use it three or four times. And then it becomes so dirty, you either need to find a way to remediate it, which is very expensive, or you have to throw it away, which is incredibly expensive. The other issue is once you do an ethanol extraction, your post-processed biomass, say that five times fast, a uh, post-processed biomass uh, has ethanol in it. Now, no matter how much you think you've gotten it out, there's a residual in that now that's going to do two things. It's going to make it so you can't use it for things like pet bedding or pet feed. And it's also going to make it an explosive fire hazard. Uh, in the incinerator business, they call it a flash exposure. But they can't put that kind of a material in an incinerator because they might blow their incinerator up. And so it, the ethanol system has created a huge waste stream that people are just starting to struggle with. I know processors that have entire warehouses, but they're doing nothing but storing the material after they process it because they don't know what they're going to do. So part of what we've been doing is working with some different solvents. And, you know, if you look at the range of solvents in the marketplace today, uh, of course, you've got CO2. If you compare CO2 and ethanol, CO2's got some great factors to it. Uh, you know, it leaves pesticides and heavy metals behind. You can pull out the terpenes prior to the extraction. Um, you can even do a type of chromatography with CO2 at the end with THC. The challenge that I found with CO2 is that you spend roughly six times as much for the hardware as you do for an equal output of ethanol. It's very expensive. And the other issue with CO2 is efficiency. And one of the, the, the concepts I try to communicate to processors is, what's the net amount of cannabinoids you're getting out of? There's, 10% cannabinoids in the material, and you do a first pass. You're getting 50%, 60%, 70%, and CO2 runs in that 50% range of the first pass efficiency. Ethanol tons, tends to run in the 60% range, and hydrocarbons tend to run in the 70% range. So in addition to CO2 being more expensive, it's not as efficient in, in the beginning. But the biggest difference between these three different solvents is the post-processing required. Uh, if anybody's ever done a CO2 extraction and see the yellow goo spitting out of that machine, they know that they're two or three steps away from having a finished product at a minimum. The same is true with ethanol. You've done a crude ethanol extraction, and you see that black green goo spitting out of the spigot, you know you've got a couple steps before you've got to sell it. 
So one of the reasons cannabis, as you said, uses hydrocarbons is what spits out of the nozzle is crude, is sellable, is shatter, wax of some kind, and then you could do more post-processing, but maybe only one light step. And so one of the things that we're trying to do in, is create a system, an extraction system, that uses industrial grade propane. And that produces an extract crude that's over 80% pure CBD. And we use some methods that get the THC under 1% so that the crude that we're making is a sellable product. More importantly, we can actually go straight to crystallization with that crude without having to go through the distillation step. And if you look at ethanol and CO2, you look at the cost of distillation, I have kind of a rough formula, doesn't always apply. But for every dollar you spend on extraction for ethanol, you'll spend roughly $2.50 downstream for post-processing equipment to match capacity. One of the things that Ian Laird talked about in the hemp benchmarks is the bottlenecks in the industry. And I've noticed that a lot of facilities have about a third or half the throughput capacity on distillation that they have for extraction. So if they're spitting out 10 liters an hour on the crude machine, their distil distiller can only intake about five. That's a big bottleneck for folks. And then if you go down to that next step of THC remediation, it gets even worse. So if you have the capacity to do a crude extraction, it doesn't require distillation. I'd like to think that's a game changer. And so one of the ways we're doing that is uh, experimenting with inline filtration systems. Mm -hmm. And you can really break those into two different categories without getting dirty into the technical details and breaking NDAs. One is, is that you can do a, almost like a distillation filtration. And this will clean up the oil and give you that distillate quality crude, uh, literally right out of the crude nozzle. The second thing that we've been experimenting with, and, and we're not the only ones to do this, there is an ability to do what I call poor man's chromatography, which essentially you're putting a chromatography column in line on your crude extraction next to the other filters that are taking out impurities. And we have had great success uh, pulling out over two thirds of the THC. So we're not quite at the point where we're going THC free, but we are at a point where we're producing products which are dramatically lower THC. Absolutely, and that, that is gonna be a big one. I know that you know, we've been collaborating on that project and uh, tracking it quite closely uh, from day one. Uh, you know, with so many different filtration medias out there to try. I mean, the, right. the cannabis and hemp industries together have only really barely scratched the surface of what's possible out there with the uh, various silicate medias, uh, you know, polymer uh, medias, different types of uh, resins. And then you get into things like molecularly infinite polymers that we're starting to see. We're only right. at the very, very, very early uh, uh, phase of prototyping and research on what's feasible with filtration. But what we're seeing, uh, you know, both from our collaboration and from others is THC remediation without actually using chromatography. So by using an absorption approach, a filtration approach, yeah. uh, seems feasible. And uh, yeah. there's other folks that are taking a catalytic approach to try and destroy the THC or- Right, to isomerize it to TH, to delta eight. Yep, or just, uh, you know, or just get rid of it into some other degradative product. If right. we can just if we can just selectively absorb it, selectively you know pull it out of the oil as the oil is passing past it, um, I mean that would just be a huge cost reduction. The chromatography right. processes are the, by far the most expensive hardware in the process line. Uh, per oh, absolutely, capacity. and that's why it's so small a, a total capacity as compared to total market. Um, sure, and also key to note here that is THC free products specifically the category THC free distillate, which in, in the case of hydrocarbons could just be THC free crude oil that is better than 75% uh, potency or, or maybe better than 80% right. potency, um, which is totally feasible. Uh, you know, we've proved it, many others have proved it. It's common in the, uh, in the medical and recreational cannabis market to achieve yeah. those numbers. Um, then if you can get a reduced THC or THC free 
product uh, that would you know get access to a market that at this point is the most downward price pressure resistant uh, commodity right. section in the market and you know maybe we should talk about about CBDA and the asset forms instead I was of just going to say that yeah. well there's one point I want to make about THC remediation we may talk more about that later and that is that one of the uh, kind of the unicorn in the seed breeding field right now is THC free seeds they're out there and as they become ubiquitous that may make the whole concept of THC remediation moot however what that won't change is our need to be able to remediate out pesticides and heavy metals, which is the same technology. So I'll go back up and answer your other question about CBDA. One of the key facets to the program that we're working on now is the ability to not only extract CBD, but really keep it in its acidic form, CBDA, all the way through the process. And as you know, one of the problems with ethanol, even though you might do a cryo extraction, and have your crude oil that's pre-winterized, pre that could be mostly CBDA. The minute you put it through that falling film evaporator to lose your ethanol, to pull that ethanol out, you're gonna decarboxylate most of that cannabinoid. Oh, I, I, I should stop you there. I don't think that that's okay. necessarily the case. The, the vacuum process, um, you know, using vacuum to achieve uh, solvent recovery, you can keep most of your cannabinoids in acid form. We do that routinely. However, you're stuck at that point at the concentration of the crude that you've got. So if you're going to go downstream right. and distill it, you have to have a separate process to decarboxylate it. And then from there, go to distillation if you're trying to get up right. to those 80s and 90s. That's, I was going to share that as, as you know, if you go to distillation at that point, even with short residency time, you're going to start to decarb your cannabinoids. So with our process, uh, you know, we're able to produce, you know, 97, 98% CBDA. And there's a couple benefits to that. One is you end up with 13% more product, right? You have 13% more extract. And that's a great way to, to better your bottom line. More importantly, from an efficacy standpoint or pharmacological standpoint, you look at studies that are being done in places like Israel, they're finding that the body or the cells in our body uptake CBDA at roughly a rate of 10 times that of CBD. So they find that we only uptake about 6% of the CBD that we ingest, where it's over 60% if it's in the form of CBDA. Huge, huge numbers. I mean, you know, yeah. and, and as we get into legitimated uh, nutraceutical products, uh, nutritional supplement type products, once the FDA comes to some sort of accord that it can be used in food and nutritional supplements, uh, it, that's going to be a huge advantage for the companies that come out and uh, and do their marketing studies, do their clinical marketing studies, not to be confused with the pharmaceutical uh, clinical studies to get pharmaceuticals right. approved. But right. in order to make a claim for a nutraceutical or for a nutritional supplement, they can do a study that says the uptake of this uh, acid, cannab acid form cannabinoid was, like I said, maybe it's 10% greater than uh, the you know, CBD competition, well, obviously there's a huge motivator there for the oh, yeah. marketing perspective. And, from a, and honestly, from a consumer protection uh, standpoint, if you have the opportunity to give them so much more efficacy at such a, uh, a lower concentration or a lower number of milligrams, right. that just seems like an obvious win. Now, what we will have to wait and see uh, and early results seem positive is whether CBDA has the same type of physiological effects as right. CBD, where the differences are and where the opportunities lie to, uh, to be able to, you know, have other wellness benefits marketable for CBDA and other acid form cannabinoids. Right. But all of this brings up a question, Emmett, and the question is why? Why, if, if hydrocarbons have all these benefits of producing a cleaner extract without the need for distillation, why isn't everyone doing it? And a lot of that comes from some misconceptions of hydrocarbons, not doing a hydrocarbon, handling them safely. But the other issue is a fire code issue. Most people build their extraction systems to fit in a C1B1 fireproof enclosure. And the problem with that, or fire resistant, uh, the problem with that is you relegate yourself to a 300 gallon per C1D1 area. And if you've got a you know, three to one ratio on your extracts, the most you'll be able to extract in that room is about 100 pounds of run. 
As you know, there's a couple of folks out there using a fogging system where they increase that efficiency closer to two to one. They're, they're doing 150 pounds a run. But remember, you really need to be at about a 500 pound run number to begin to compete in the next year or two. So one of the epiphanies that we've had in designing this new system that we're working on now is that you really need to start in your facility planning with H2 and H3 class in mind. And that's gonna give you the, the ability to handle much larger and in some cases unlimited amounts of solvent, whether it's ethanol or hydrocarbon. Have you been working with H class facilities, Emmett? Absolutely, and you know, it's, it's interesting because the most common place we see, you know, H2, H3 or H1 uh, designation is in the solvent storage lockers. So in ethanol facilities, as well as hydrocarbon facilities, we see these sort of prefabricated solvent storage lockers that will be installed exterior to the building or directly adjacent to it to allow them to store more than that 300 pounds. And we should be clear, it's 300 pounds of solvent in the hydrocarbon case um, in a single area. Now, but then they're going inside their buildings and they have a, an F2 or, or F1 classified uh, area where they have this class one division one uh, room that they built or prefab and they're limited on their solvent uh, storage capacity or solid utilization capacity there. Um, and so, you know, there's a kind of a disconnect. If you just built the actual production room to the same standard that your storage room is built to, right you can have as much solvent in that process as you wanted. Now, the trigger here, and this is where a lot of people, you know, make a mis misstep early on in their planning process is, it is much easier to get that H class designation if you're on industrial property and not right. on commercial property. In commercial, right. it can be very difficult. But on industrial zone property, uh, where, you know, things like uh, tank farms for gas distribution are housed regularly, well, obviously they get that same H classification to have these giant right. storage systems. So, you know, maybe, uh, I, actually I think it's almost certain, uh, and the large, the large players already are doing this. You know, all right. of the large facilities, you see something that's, you know, anything bigger than, I would say bigger than maybe six or 7,000 pounds a day of production capacity, almost certainly their production rooms are, are very classified. And as you know, we, we all started this as a cottage industry, trying to do this on mom and dad's EFU, agriculturally zoned property, or you know some other zoning. And it, it, I know I, I know processors right now that are moving their facilities because of these reasons. And, and one other point you brought up is as you start to increase your scale and increase your storage capacity, you start to lower your costs and become more profitable. If I can store six thousand gallons instead of five hundred, suddenly my fuel costs go down. Uh, by by maybe a third, and my delivery costs go go down by by uh, to a sixth of what they were, and so that's one of the big benefits of having large fuel capacity. Right, absolutely. Getting getting that next uh, bulk or uh, or you know mini bulk or true bulk pricing tier of your uh, solvent purchasing, you know that gives you huge price benefits. I I've seen even better than a third actually out right. there on the price reduction. Oh, I've um, seen two thirds. Yep, now that instrument grade or, or I grade uh, propane, that's a specialty product. Same with I grade butane, you go right. down the list. So building a relationship, knowing your suppliers ahead of time and knowing right. where they're distributing from and that you can get that truck to your facility quickly, also a key factor in, in planning right. your facility. Uh, but if you can do it and you can do it reliably, you know, huge, huge cost benefit. Yep, yep. And so since we're kind of running out of time here, there are two other topics I wanted to hit if I could, Emmett, and they all relate again to being, go on, I'm sorry. Hold on just a second, Steve. Sure. So I do at this point, let's uh, please encourage everybody, if you have a question out there that you'd like Steve or myself to answer for you, really wide open this week, uh, any topic is uh, legitimate. Uh, again, Steve has firsthand experience in production facilities, processing, cultivation, in uh, sale of biomass, sale of ingredients. So pretty much across the board, you have an opportunity to ask a, a real industry insider here uh, any questions you might have. Please use the chat box or the Q&A box uh, and we will get to that um, as quickly as we can. Uh, but in the meantime, sorry, Steve. Uh, oh no, go for it. Are you gonna mention? So 
we'll go back to that statistic from Oregon Industrial Hemp Council. There's these 20,000 other uses for hemp. And I think that one of the things is margins, profit margins are declining and compressing in this industry that we need to look at are ways to monetize our waste. Instead of our waste costing us money, we might actually be able to at least be neutral and potentially make money on waste. And the third is fiber. So I want to just take a minute to talk about the waste. I've always divided waste into three categories. One is you just incinerate. So you're, you're handling it as little as possible. Maybe you've got a conveyor that's bringing it outside of your extractor into an incinerator and you're just burning it, but you need to do that in an EPA compliant manner. The second way costs quite a bit more money, a little bit more money, and that's to create some type of a heat exchanger where you're capturing the heat that you're generating in that incinerator. And any processor knows there's plenty of places in your process where you can use that recirculating heat. And of course, you'll save a lot of money on electricity if you're able to do that. Plus, you can also heat your facility with that kind of heat if you're in a cold weather environment. The third, which is a lot more expensive, but there is a serious return on investment if you look at this, is to use an incinerator and marry that with a generating system. Some of the, the, the lower sophisticated systems uh, just simply uh, create, again, a heat exchange loop. And some of the more sophisticated systems, uh, there's a particular one that we've decided on. It's a German system. It actually has a valve where it generates electricity and you can decide what percentage of your heat output you want is electricity or heat and you can change that based on the time of day or you know how you're using things and in some cases if you're in a network that allows what's called net metering you may actually be, generate more power and be able to take waste from your neighboring processes and burn it and actually generate money through electricity that you sell back to the grid so right, that's maybe. one thing I'll stop there and see if you have any comments about that oh yeah i mean it's extremely exciting and, and you know just to you mentioned you might be able to take waste from your neighboring processors but potentially not only your neighboring processors this could be anything from paper waste uh to uh, you know to biomass woody biomass waste agricultural waste of other right. types coming from other food and agricultural plants i mean there's if you go that direction uh, it, it could be relatively easy to get your hands on, on biomass to feed your incinerator, even if your own waste stream doesn't uh, make that up. I know in Oregon in particular, there's been some pretty strong results from uh, uh, generating stations that were set up to do uh, woody biomass uh, recovered right. from national forests. Um, and so the promise and the proof of concept is already done. Uh, and in fact, there are some very large logging facilities in Oregon that have these types of uh, you know heat to power generating uh, stations, right? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of those plants are closing down now because the logging industry is uh, being outcompeted by international right. sources. But uh, but overall, you know, this is not a you know brand new concept that's never been no. tried. It's really tried and true. It just it, this would be one of very few instances of bringing it into the hemp industry, which we have a big waste problem. Why not? You know, Huge. make some money off it. There's two points, two rabbit holes I went down that I'll share with the group briefly. And one is when you look at uh, other types of incinerators, they tend to try to do what's called gasification, where they take that biomass, they put it in a biogenerator, they create methane gas, and they burn the methane. It's a lot cleaner way to do it. The problem is that won't work with hemp because of the lignin structure in it. And the second is that it doesn't make financial sense to pelletize hemp and burn its fuels because wood fuel is measured based on BTU and ash content. And although the BTU content of hemp is very similar to that of hardwood, the ash, uh, typical hardwood ash is half a percent and, and hemp can have as much as 20% ash. And it's just not a viable product for things like heat stoves or incinerators. And that actually maybe is a, a benefit in some circumstances because I, I think we had talked about biochar uh, as being another another potential byproduct from the hemp industry. Right. Uh, not just burning it to a fine ash like you might in a, in a standard generator, uh, right. but actually doing that careful pressure control burn right. where you're generating the biochar. Yeah. Can you tell yeah. us, have you seen any of that in the market yet? Or I'm or? sitting next to a biochar plant right now. Uh, I'm down in Medford, Oregon. And... Um, so that kind of is a good transition to fiber. You know, 
there is a belief, and I know Ian Laird at Hemp Benchmarks believes this and says this, that there's more profit to be had on the fiber than there will be in the CBD, or at least as much. There's a couple disconnects there, though. And the first is that the type of plant that we're growing for CBD doesn't produce as much fiber, quite a bit less. And conversely, the type of plant that grows fiber doesn't produce a lot of CBD. And so there's a disconnect there that through genetics can be changed, but it's something to consider. The second core problem we face with the fiber market right now is the decortication. These are machines that take those stalks and separate the bast from their herds into two different materials that are used for different, different uh, products. The other types of decortication systems that are on the market right now have run into the exact same problems that hemp harvesters ran into. And if anyone last year tried to take a, you know, a, a typical harvester and run into the field and pull hemp out, they know that the, the fibers in that stock are so strong that they wrap around motors and they have a tendency to burn them up or burn bearings up. Same thing with decorticators. Good news is there are industry uh, technologies being developed for hemp to separate the bass from the herds, which brings me to the third challenge. Like so many things in this industry, we have a product that's chasing a market that's yet to be developed. We have a, a couple different things in, in the fiber market. One is uh, you have the, the hempcrete type uses. You hear a lot of talk about that. Uh, and you were mentioning, maybe you could share with the group uh, what's going on in the building industry with hempcrete. Absolutely. So that was some, some good news from, I believe, late last month that there are uh, a couple of different groups bringing hempcrete through the official formal testing process to get it validated as a structural material for use under the uh, International Building Code and mm -hmm. the US uh, National Building Code. So as of right now, you can only use hempcrete as a, you know, a specialty or uh, an experimental uh, cladding or insulation uh, type of product. Yeah. But what we'd really like to see is hempcrete uh, be validated as a structural product so that you could use probably steel reinforced hempcrete as a uh, building where you just build a wall. You don't need to stick frame it. You just frame it out with uh, steel like normal concrete, uh, pour hempcrete in. So you're right. reducing the amount of lime you're using, reducing the amount of sand you're using, which is a real problem right now, getting right. that sand. Um, and, uh, and you're increasing the insulative value of that concrete as well, hugely. So real benefits in terms of usage, but right now it's held back because it's not in the code. Well, probably two years out at this, this point, right. looking like, but, but maybe in two years, you'll be able to build a standard with hempcrete like they do in some other countries like the UK. Right. And as you know, they're making particle boards and insulation and, and, and those fibers go into many other industries. One of the biggest industries, again, I'm going to reference Ian Laird's comments uh, last week on the paper industry. Boy, I'll tell you, if the paper industry shifts to using hemp, that'll be a game changer. The automotive industry. Um, I've read reports that about 15% of, uh, of the interior of a BMW is made with a hemp derivative product. So looking at those type of products, and then we go to things like biochar. Uh, we also have things like graphene-like substances that are being uh, produced. So there's definitely some products in the, in the workplace. I know uh, uh, Levi Strauss did a very successful test last year where they were able to integrate a hemp fiber, which tends to be a little coarse, into cotton in a way that made it very smooth and subtle. subtle. So as these products get developed, and, and manufacturers gear up, I think you're gonna find a huge demand. And I guess the final point to that I will make is that the processing capacity is about to expand significantly. There's a facility in Texas uh, that's been funded with tens of millions of dollars. They hope to be online, I believe in the next 24 months, and they're the, gonna have the capacity to produce uh, or process quite a bit of, of this fiber. That's great. Well, I see a question from the field. Uh, what about the other fractions besides biomass and CBD, the waxes, terpenes, et cetera? I think we have uh, Tao Fei interested in, you know, byproducts from the, from the oil extraction uh, right. process that are not the target cannabinoids. Uh, you know, I have a couple of interesting anecdotes there, but maybe you, you have some as well. You know, I, I look at the ethanol industry 
You know, when they make ethanol from corn, they produce massive billions of tons of waste and none of it goes to waste. And the same should be true for hemp. Uh, we could be making soaps and other types of substances out of the fats. Uh, we could be using, you know, the other types of cannabinoids in other studies for other medical uses. I think that the core factor beyond the FDA opening up generally uh, accepted as uh, safe status is allowing research and development for these microcannabinoids. Uh, recently, I read a study where there's a substance in cannabis in hemp. It's not even a cannabinoid, but it's roughly 30 times more effective than opium at stopping pain, and it's not one of the cannabinoids. So if we're able to fractionalize those things out, um, oh, what's the gentleman's name? He's the father of cannabis. His first name's Ed, and his last name is just escaped me. Ed. Yeah. He's really well known. He always wears a white coat. They call him the doctor of cannabis. Oh, are you talking about Ed, uh, R Rosenthal? Yes, Ed Rosenthal. Rosenthal. Yeah. So Ed's got an expression I love. He said, if some botanist discovered cannabis, too, he would get a Nobel Prize and it would be considered the greatest botanical uh, discovery of the century. The problem is he'd have to do, he'd have to accept his award from jail. And so, um, I think that it, you know, this whole industry is gonna begin and end with FDA acceptance and R&D to show what we can use those minor cannabinoids. Well, I, and you know, a couple of uh, points that I, I will make is that I am absolutely aware of a market for hemp-derived terpenes, um, you know, being quite, quite pricey per liter right now. Um, this is largely because, at least in our experience, it is very hard to maintain the good terpene profile of this oil uh, when you use ethanol specifically uh, because it creates some byproduct acids and other uh, reaction compounds where it does react with the terpenes in the material. Um, so you're not going to get the same terpene profile uh, in the plant that you uh, in the ethanol extract. Um, so right. for that reason, for, for those manufacturers that are able to pull the terpenes out um, without degrading them, so using cold processes, again, a huge advantage for hydrocarbons, sure. uh, especially light hydrocarbons on that side. Um, there is, I mean, I've heard prices in the multiple thousands per liter uh, for the terpenes, um, and that's for a broad, you know, broad uh, terpene uh, profile. So not isolated terpene, right. we're talking about just the terpene cut. Of course, people are using that to create uh, bait pens, but they're also right. starting to use it in other fragrance and uh, flavor products. Um, right. Waxes wise, uh, I've seen, you know, the classic one is soaps, right? There definitely are soaps being made, uh, skin products being made using right. some of the waxi waxes and oils that are non-cannabinoid, um, chapstick. Um, I, I've actually even seen, I don't know whether this ever took off, but I saw a hemp uh, wax inclusive leather treatment product at one point. Interesting. Um, yeah, so you're getting, you know, I think it was for wa increasing water resistance and just lifetime of leathers. So yeah, there's some interesting byproducts. I mean, we're just barely scratching the surface. As Steve said, 20,000 uses. A lot of those uses probably were from the resins, waxes, oils, uh, both from the seed, but also, um, but also from the stalks, from the extracts. Um, there's, you know, thousands of compounds in this plant. Right. It's all coming down to R&D. And in fact, right now, if you look at it, the FDA has actually reached out to industry leaders in the hemp business to fund the latest study on CBD liver toxicity. So the federal government's not spending money, but they're going to use that data because it's going to be an FDA controlled study uh, to help us get this grass certification. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And of course, we're all, you know, enthusiastic and hopeful that that will uh, come out with positive results. And that, of course, there was some early studies saying there might be some liver toxicity issues with CBD, particularly. I, among many others, am of the belief that that's probably due to a lack of control for other uh, substance use, especially alcohol. But um, we'll see how these more established studies go. And we hope that they will differentiate between CBDA, CBD, and the other right. cannabinoids individually. Uh, so because of course, uh, we are a, a very responsible industry. We're trying to keep consumer safety in utmost mind. What we know is people, you know, 
people in the recreational and medical market, especially in the medical market where um, consumption for people that have uh, long-term pain issues or, or other uh, things that are sometimes treated with medical cannabis uh, legally, you know, that they consume very high amounts of cannabinoids every day over right. many years and, uh, and haven't experienced liver failure in the same way that, say, alcoholics over that same uh, time period frequently do. So, um, you know, at least anecdotally, we know that cannabis itself uh, doesn't seem to have that sort of liver toxicity, but getting down to specifics and getting a, official FDA recognition of the safety, that's of course a huge uh, limiting factor for the industry. And uh, we feel very confident that we're gonna come out with a hemp and cannabis derived product that we can sell around the world freely uh, one way or the other. Right. Well, I guess that's the last overriding point I could make is for us to be responsible business owners, both to our workers, to our customers, and to the environment, it's going to start with us being profitable and us scaling up efficiently and us using our resources and using the whole plant as efficiently as we can. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, I, I know I have a couple more minutes. If we do have any questions from the field, um, please do write in. Otherwise, we may wrap up shortly. We'll give a few more minutes. Um, and let's see here. I did see somebody commenting in the comments that's, that they are working in the paper industry. Not to worry. If you have any additional commentary, we'd love to hear anything you have to share about the status of the use of hemp in the paper industry. Um, yeah, if someone's out there is in the paper industry, please, please let us know because you know, we're, you know, last year I went up to Montana, excuse me, this, this January, and the, about 90% of what they produced last year is still in the fields, in bales. And th there's so much mass out there right now that's begging for a market. And, and frankly, some of these farmers would give it away to make space. And so if anyone out there is in the paper industry and wants to start a pilot project, um, we're actually starting a decortication facility in Medford right now. And that would be very, very interested to hear, hear about that. Yeah, so Charlie, uh please do feel free to email us. You can use the contact form uh, on the Sci-Fi Systems website, or, uh, or I believe you could also reply to the registration confirmation that you got um, to get to this webinar. And we can uh, tie you in with Steve and our team and, and open up some discussion about paper. Um, we do have uh, some interesting contacts on the fiber side. Steve in particular uh, brings a lot of different industry contacts. Um, another thing that I do want to emphasize here is you, you mentioned something when we were talking the other day about plastics and the use of hemp in uh, plastics or in polymers. Um, and I think that that is a very interesting area. Um, what are your thoughts on some of these, you know, hemp fiber inclusive uh, plastics that you're seeing out there? Well, again, we're at a point where R&D needs to be done. And I think that as an industry is, is new, it needs to be careful of being led down rabbit holes that aren't verifiable. And I myself got led down one of these rabbit holes. I know I wasn't alone uh, because there was a lot of talk about a company. And by the way, this, this story is on the internet, so I'm not gonna name any names on it right now, but um, there's been a lot of talk of infusing plastic with hemp. And, and, and the claim was that not only are you using hemp to make the plastic, but you then have a biodegradable hemp. Now, the foundation is somebody actually looked into this, a, 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 a chemical scientist looked into this and went to a workshop that this company did, kind of did and confronted them with some of their own facts. And some of the things that were mentioned were this, that you know, if you ever buy a plastic bottle and you take a look at the bottom of the bottle, you're gonna see there's a number stamped on the bottom. That's the type of plastic it is. And all plastics recyclable, Although most of it is not recycled because it's not cost effective to recycle. But the problem is that the minute you put hemp in this plastic bottle, it's no longer recyclable. It can't, it's not pure enough. So there is some technology in Europe that's recycling that specialized hemp infused uh, plastic, but it's so minimal right now. And again, it's a product chasing a market that's yet to be developed. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting that that, that recyclability issue is, is sort of a, uh, 
contentious one right now because the international market for recycled plastics has really crashed, um, right. especially along with the oil, oil pricing. So right. the claim about its, its biodegradability, uh, well, biodegradability and compostability, these are two very fraught terms right now. Of course, what we right. want is a truly biodegradable product that in any right. condition will break down within, you know, at minimum like 10 years, right? That would be the ideal. Uh, well, the target is 12 months. Right. So this is one of the other things is they said, you know, can we put it in some type of an anaerobic digester? Is there something we can do to break it down in about 12 months? Because right now this, this system takes like 99 years to biodegrade. You know, and so that's just not a realistic time frame. And the point to that, the punchline to that story is that all of the PR, all of these stories were coming from the company that was making this. So, you know, you need to be careful. Uh, you know, I went down the road of hempcrete until I realized it wasn't IBC approved. Could it be IBC approved in a year or two? Sure. But until it is, it's not a viable product. And frankly, some of the most viable products I've seen in the fiber market right now are very common products. Uh, pet bedding uh, is one example. Just very basic, very simple. Well, I'll push back on you a little bit. I think that hemp okay. is a viable product as an insulating product, right? It just isn't a structural product. Um, right. But but at the same time, again, you know that IBC approval is going to push it really over uh, over the hump. Right now, it's sure. still specialty application, which means added you know, added scrutiny from your local jurisdiction, which always adds time and potential cost right. to projects. So, so admittedly, it's not an easy process. Um, sure. on, on the other side, though, I do want to push this a little bit harder. There's something that I, okay. I've seen. If you're not, you know, let's assume that a lot of the plastic out there is not getting recycled, because right now right. it's not. Um, somebody was mentioning to me that uh, you know, basically the, the point of some, some of these packaging companies specifically that are adding hemp into the packaging and they're using something like PLA or another uh, plastic that's produced from a botanical. So it is, uh, right. you know, it's sourced from a uh, biological uh, source okay. rather, than, rather than oil, right? Yeah. Um, and then they're putting hemp fiber into it is right. that, well, basically the hemp fiber is, fiber is just filler, right? So right. because of its strength, it can act as a good filler uh, so that it's a less refined, less chemically processed product that can right. take up maybe up to 30% of the volume of the plastic while retaining its structural integrity. Right. Well, right there, the point of that is just, just use less, right? Use less of the petroleum or even of the highly chemically refined corn oil or whatever your uh, PLA or other plastics being used by. So that type of thinking it does mean that, okay, well, this isn't going to be recyclable, but if you look at all the numbers and, and come to the conclusion that, well, recycling is not working right now, how do we just reduce the total amount of plastics being produced using it as a filler? Could be a viable option. And this is especially true, I think, for high, uh, for long lifetime goods that are not typically recycled. So things like furniture, um, you know, things like uh, the car uh, applications that we've seen right. where they're using biocomposites, uh, things like um, even uh, the these sort of how do you, what do you even call these things? There, there's like fixtures. That's what I would call it. You see all these plastic parts that are used to attach up to other parts or sleeve right. other parts. Those are totally viable uses. Those those things very sure. rarely get recycled. And we could reduce the amount of, of petroleum going into those products quite substantially if we were to infuse them uh, with hemp fiber. So that's something sure. I love to see data on. Oh, I agree. I mean, you can go onto YouTube now and see Henry Ford whacking the side of his, his hemp car with a sledgehammer that he made the quarter panels out of a, a hemp polymer. And that was Henry Ford, I think that was 100 years ago. Yeah. So again, I agree with you wholeheartedly that hemp will be an important part of the of the, uh, the market for making these types of polymers, but you're talking about paying chemical scientists. And I always joke to people that a, a, a bad chemist costs more an hour than a good lawyer. And they're very expensive. And you're talking about a three, five year development project. And, and one of my favorite examples is the Incredible Burger. When the, if you listen to the NPR podcast on the Incredible Burgers inventor, 
their first times where they were making the Incredible Burger, it was thousands of dollars for like a six ounce piece. And it took them years. Yes, they developed the product, but it took them years to get that product to a point where they could spit a burger out and sell it in a burger place in a cost effective number. And that's yeah. where we're at right now. And now they're a billion dollar company. So it takes some patience, patience persistence, right? Exactly. Uh, we're, we're, exactly. This is a young business. That perspective of perseverance and the ability and uh, wherewithal to do that research, that's what we need here because the possibilities are endless, but it's going to take those few years of hard development to really get there. Right. Um, I've got, there is a question here, uh, which okay. maybe we'll just take this one question and, uh, and sure. then we can wrap up. Uh, can the fiber be put in food? What is the FDA's position on CBD hemp fiber in food? I'm not, uh, I have some wild hypotheses on this that are not informed by actual research, but maybe you have any uh, perspective on this? Well, it's my understanding, if you don't post-process the plant, you can take hemp and put it in food right now, legally. It's not That's CBD. That, that mirrors my understanding as well, where because hemp seed is, right. uh, is a long time used food product, and, uh, and because the, as well as other, you know, just the botanical roughage, uh, things like juice right. as well. Um, there's right. a history from, you know, before uh, cannabis was criminalized, uh, right. the use of this in food products, that it is viable to do that. Now, there's a, another question, which is it really advisable to put hemp fiber into food? Um, I suspect that's pretty hard on the digestive system. Uh, I do know people often uh, drinking uh, the leaves, uh, the cannabis juice from uh, right. leaves of cannabis or hemp, either one, um, and really talk that up as a food product. But as far as the fiber from the stalk uh, or even from the leaves itself, eating the leaves directly, it's a very high silica content. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure, it may be a little bit rough uh, on the digestive tract. I'm not, do you have any? Well, Emmett, we live in a world where people are drinking bleach to, to get themselves rid of coronavirus. So I would say that probably right now, the biggest market for enhancing feed is in the, in the, uh, the agricultural industry, people feeding uh, cows and sheep. And, and an important note that they've found in the farming industry is that a good ratio is about 10% hemp to whatever regular feed. And if you give the animals more than that, you start to run into gas, gasification issues. Right, so, you know, and, and maybe there's a blend here, maybe one or 2% of cannabis. I, maybe they're thinking of replacing a uh, soluble fiber or those other types of food fibers uh, with cannabis or hemp uh, fiber. I would say it's viable. I've talked to a food scientist about the different structures of this versus the other sources right. of fiber. Uh, that's not us. Maybe we can look forward to having somebody like that on the uh, Plants to Plants uh, uh, webinar series in season two or season three. Um, but in the meantime, you know, feel free to experiment, but do so lightly. And, uh, right. like, and, feel, and please report your results. I mean, I can't stress this enough. This whole industry right now needs research, development, published results that are peer reviewed. And I'm here to tell you that if there's a peer reviewed article that says that CBD or you know, one of my favorite antidotes is CBG, uh, some of the uh, makeup people think it's you know, the, the fountain of youth. Well, if there's some data to support that it's gonna help you lose these lines right here, I wouldn't be able to pump CBG out fast enough, would I? Yep, that's totally correct. Yeah, there's a whole mountain of research. Oh, here's yep. another question coming in. Okay. What, what about making ethanol from biomass waste, assuming the starch content is high enough? I can take that one. So okay. um, the problem with hemp biomass uh, as an ethanol stock is that the carbohydrate load um, is relatively low as compared to the standard crops, which are currently made into ethanol. Um, so the, the starch levels, you know, you compare it to something like uh, corn waste, uh, or to uh, something along the lines of soy uh, type uh, ethanol, you know, they're, those are typically using the low quality grain as the feedstock uh, for the ethanol production. And that's because there's a, a very large surplus in those uh, agricultural markets. So the same goes for uh, ethanol 
from uh, hemp seed or even uh, biofuels from hemp seed, not that viable in today's market because one, hemp oil on the food market is a premium product. Um, there is no surplus hemp food oil right now. Um, so no, it's gonna be exorbitantly expensive to use it as a uh, ingredient to transform into what is a commodity product in ethanol. But the, on the other side, there is a huge surplus of ethanol production capacity right now from the corn and, uh, and soy industries, especially because essentially demand for ethanol rises and falls along with the price of oil. Right now, the price of oil is very low. So the demand for ethanol to blend into gasoline uh, has gone dramatically down uh, because the large scale buyers of those products uh, will buy the pure over the ethanol diluted uh, gasoline as long as that gasoline is lower cost than the ethanol blend. So um, right now, not a great time to try and uh, produce ethanol from uh, the biomass, but is it, is it possible? I'm sure it's possible. Is it viable as a business? Uh, probably not. Emmett, that brings up one other point, if I could throw it in the last minute here, and that is, um, I don't want to throw the ethanol industry under the bus here in terms of extraction, because, you know, I have, and as you know, there are facilities out there that are actually redistilling their ethanol and cleaning it up. But in your estimation, how big does an operation have to be for that to make cost effective sense? If you're buying new equipment to reproof your ethanol, the smallest scale that we've seen where it's really proved to be viable is somewhere in the order of 10,000 pounds a day of throughput capacity of biomass input. Mm -hmm. Sounds right. Um, so that's, now that said, there are various ways to bring the cost of these things down, but the cost both of the hardware, but also the operating cost for those reproofing right. uh, distillation uh, columns and filtration systems, relatively high. Now that said, we've been looking for an ideal membrane solution uh, to this reproofing problem. It does seem like it's feasible, uh, but the, given that the main uh, contaminant in the ethanol is terpenes in addition to water, terpenes, the combination of terpenes, ethanol and water and uh, contacting a membrane for the purposes of removing the water specifically, it's a relatively difficult uh, separation okay. because uh, the terpenes themselves can degrade the membranes. So okay. that said, do I think in the next couple of years, probably we're gonna see a specialty membrane coming out for reproofing ethanol? It seems pretty likely. Is it gonna be relatively expensive? Almost certainly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so at the large scale, is it viable right now? Yes, but it is not that cheap per unit capacity. Um, so it's possible to, to avoid that ethanol uh, solvent replacement cost. And that is a responsible thing to do, I should say. If you are going to do ethanol at large scale, you should be reproofing your ethanol because throwing it out, I mean, the ecological footprint of producing that ethanol is uh, going to be really high if you just keep throwing it out every three or four uses. Um, right. So do it if you need to, but, uh, but planning a process where you don't have to do it in the first place, there's some real advantages to that on the uh, long-term cost perspective, right. like operating costs. Well, as you know, Emmett, some of those filters are being made uh, using uh, graphene, very thin type graphene carbon fiber filters. And uh, I guess one final point to the fiber is that you can turn hemp into a graphene-like substance. It's not graphene, it's not graphite. It's not made with graphite but it actually has proper properties that are better than regular graphene in other ways for being made into electrical components like semiconductors and transistors. I have, I've heard that. Yeah, great results out of Canada. I've heard that that uh, Canadian technology has actually gone into a uh, first large scale commercial pilot. Um, I don't know when that's going to open and they're going to start, uh, you know, rolling out actual manufacturing, but that's a good, uh, you know, good indication that, I think that their primary target use initially was for battery uh, electrodes, um, right. where they have a very high surface area, extremely good conduction, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they've developed what appeared at least at first to be an extremely uh, efficient, cost-efficient process for uh, transitioning the fiber into those yep. uh, carbon nanofilaments. Now, the flip side of that is as they scale up, they're gonna need a good supply of that base 
uh, hemp fiber uh, because it has to be a very fine, very highly refined fiber from the right. starting place to then scale up. So that'll create demand for, uh, for another you know, fiber market to address. Right, or well, the ability to be able to charge a phone in seconds or a car in minutes is going to start to get more and more valuable as time goes on. Yeah, absolutely, it's the yeah. you know the next uh, next era of technology will be dependent on uh, high efficiency batteries. We see well, we've seemed like we're ten years out away from it for you know the past fifty years. So, yeah. but the experimental results are really positive right now. So, uh, <laughs> hemp may well have a place to to play, uh, part to play in that uh, progress. Well, Steve, it has been absolutely great to speak with you. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, for those of you who want to get in touch with Steve Fuhrer or Steven Fuhrer, uh, what is the best email uh, to get to you with? Uh, you can use Oregon Hemp Processor at gmail.com. Okay, Oregon Hemp Processor at gmail.com, all one word. And uh, you can find Steve there. Otherwise, contact us, Sci-Fi Systems. Uh, you can use the contact form on our website, www.scifisystems.com. You can find us on Instagram, uh, at Sci-Fi Systems, as well as Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera. So contact us through whatever platform uh, is uh, easiest for you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. You'll find this video on YouTube. Don't forget to join us next Thursday uh, for the final Plants to Plants finale with uh, renowned attorney Rod Kite of uh, Kite uh, Law. And uh, he's really become an international superstar <laughs> uh, from the Caminus and, and Hemp uh, legal uh, speaking as well as counsel. So uh, thanks again, Steve. And thanks everyone. Thanks for joining for us. See you next time. Appreciate it. Bye.